Can large language models discover new drug targets? Good question. I'm Doug Selinger, founder and CEO of Flex Research. Let's get into it. So uh, there's a huge amount of interest in this space. Can we use AI to discover new drugs to cure disease? Uh, where are all the AI drugs? When are they coming? How are they coming? Do we need more technology, more data, the right kind of data? What, what's really stopping this? So in this video, we're going to look at uh, large language models. Can we use large language models as they exist now to make headway here? And if not, what, what's limiting them? Why not? And what can we do about it? And we're going to take a perspective to uh, more on the mechanistic side of disease. So we're going to look at, can we use AI to understand the underlying disease processes and how to target them? So if we're going to make a drug, what should that drug do? What should it target? That's the part we're going to focus on here. And we're going to start off uh, with uh, uh, a test, sort of an example around oncology, a cancer drug. And we're going to focus on a particular signaling pathway, just as an example. Uh, this pathway is called the WINT pathway. It's a, a, a signaling pathway important for cancer. So it, it's one of the ways that uh, cells can be told to divide or not to divide. Uh, it's also important in development. It's been uh, well studied. Uh, this is a, a basic diagram of, of how it works, uh, the off state on the left and the on state on the right. So when the cell is getting a signal to divide, uh, this, this pathway is turned on and you can see that on the right. Uh, this being the cell and the outside of the cell and the nucleus here, and this signal reaching um, you know, from a Wnt ligand here, uh, telling the cell you know, by binding to, to the outside, ultimately uh, changing gene transcription in the nucleus. So you're changing gene expression and telling the cell, okay, let's divide. So we're going to use this pathway as an example, again, important in oncology and cancer. So what if we go over to uh, perplexity, which is where we'll start off, and we ask it, find me a new target. What's a new way to cure cancer? The way we're phrasing it is to identify a novel oncology target in the Wnt pathway. So it goes off, it runs web searches, it's looking at the literature uh, the, and, and seeing what it can find. Uh, what it comes back with in this case is this target PTK, PTK7. Uh, this is based on a couple of papers that it found and it, and it makes the case. The key thing here, and, and this could be an interesting target, certainly there are papers on it that we'll, we'll take a quick look at. Uh, it cites them here, number one and two. Uh, here is that first reference, uh, that a discussion of targeting this target uh, and the uses it might have uh, in cancer and other, other diseases. Here is reference number two that cited, again, uh, recent insights and therapeutic strategies targeting this, this target. So it could be a good target. One thing that, that we can tell though, is that this is not, not novel. It, it's been published, there's these reviews. This is a review article here about the target, right? So we're limited in the amount of novelty, right? We can't, it, the AI is not getting us beyond the current research, right? It, what it's doing is exposing what has already been found, helping you get to it. Basically, it's, it's a convenience. It's helping you get to, to uh, up to date quickly on what we already know, right? Pointing you to papers that you can read up on. Uh, there are certainly other LLM approaches that can be taken, but there is really this fundamental limitation. It's, it's limited by what it's trained on, which is the literature, which is the web, uh, information that we already know. So how can we go beyond that? How can we find, how can we make new discoveries that have never been published that no one has discovered before? How do we actually push, push the boundary of what we know? Uh, it's hard to see how that's going to happen by just reiterating and, and, and looking at the, the, the corpus of texts that we already have, the things that we already know, the current scientific literature, the patents, the web. So what else can we do, All right? And that's where we're gonna get into this, this approach that we've been taking at Plex Research, uh, which is that we can actually make use of relatively raw data. So what we're doing here, and this is what enables us to get into the novelty, right? To actually make new discoveries, is that rather than focus on uh, the results that are published in literature, we can focus on data, relatively raw data. So this is data that's minimally processed that often accompanies these papers, but is put in the supplemental files. They basically tables that accompany publications or sometimes straight into databases of which there are, there are thousands of databases, uh, not to mention many thousands of supplemental files uh, that do not really get analyzed, right? So, so very little 
of the information that is in these large supplemental files or in these databases actually finds its way into the text of the paper. So if we have an approach that's limited to reading papers, you know, even if it's full text or even if it's looking at patents, the information in the literature, in, in the text, is really just a very small fraction of the information that was collected, right? And just as a, I know people in the field maybe appreciate this more than uh, people who are sort of outside of the field, uh, if you're measuring the expression of all genes, you know, 20,000 or so genes, you could have, your data set could be measuring those 20,000 genes across many, many samples, right? And sometimes even thousands of samples. And you're publishing a paper with a title and, and you know, five or 10,000 words, that is not capturing all of the richness in, in that data. So, so the way we can really go beyond the literature and actually make new discoveries is by harnessing that data, right? So, so what we've done here is develop a search, uh, a tool that's run by a large language model, right? So that's what you're seeing here. So we can ask the large language model the same question uh, here. Uh, please plan and execute a research program to identify a novel oncology target in the wind pathway. Right, so we can give it this kind of question, but now instead of just going to the literature and reading papers and you know uh, inferring from that, what it can do is it can actually run a, a new analysis. Uh, it can do automated data mining. It can look at the data that's been generated, th these relatively raw measurements of genes going up and genes going down, uh, you know, of which there, there are really massive amounts. It can look at that raw data and it could it can make new discoveries, it can make inferences and, and, and look for new ways to approach uh, disease. So in this case, again, we have the WINT pathway, what we're using as our example. There are many possible strategies to go from what's known to something new. The strategy it's taking here is, is saying, well, here are some of the known players in the WINT pathway, and you can see them laid out here. Uh, and if you look at some of these names, actually, if you, we come back over to the, the overview, these will be very familiar, beta catenin, GSK3 beta, for example, axin, et cetera. So, so we can start with what's known as, as sort of a, a foundation. And then we can, we can build a strategy from there. So uh, what it's going to do then is run through each of these, right? So it's going to take each of these genes and it's going to ask if I... If I find data out there, and there's much of this, where this gene is perturbed, let's say we knock it down, and you'll see in a moment, uh, for example, beta-catenin, which is the second, the second one here. So if we knock down beta-catenin, uh, there's data out there that shows what genes are activated and, and uh, inhibited, what genes go up in level and down in level, right? There, there's many data sets like that out there. So we can look at those and we can say, well, what does this look like, right? Here is, we knock down beta-catenin, these genes go up, is there something else that if we were to knock it down, the same genes would go up or very similar genes would go up? So is there something else that looks like beta-catenin that, or I should say, acts like beta-catenin when it's knocked down, right? And perhaps one of those things is something new. You might expect some of the other uh, genes here when knocked down or when modulated, they may resemble one another because they're all part of the same uh, coordinated pathway. But what we can do is ask in an unbiased way or a data-driven way at least, what else looks like this? Is there something new that has not been described before, but when it's knocked down, looks just like one of these Wnt pathway genes, right? That's one strategy for identifying a, a whole new target, right? A brand new target. So, and that's a strategy we can execute here because we have the, this raw data, we, we have access to it. Uh, so Plex is using a, what's called a focal graph approach, which is an approach that we invented that can, uh, look through massive amounts of data, gene expression data and lots of other data to identify uh, what we call phenocopiers. So these other genes or other, other contexts, other disease states maybe that resemble uh, a Wnt pathway knockdown. All right. So that's the strategy it's gonna use. Take the thing I know about, I'm gonna look for something brand new that looks like, looks very similar to the thing that I already know about. So it executes that strategy. We're gonna go down here and just sort of see what it did. It creates a loop that it's gonna run through because it wants to run through the entire pathway. It starts by looking for uh, perturbseq profiles. So these are um, genes that when knocked down, all of the, the gene expression changes are measured. That's the perturbseq profile. So it's gonna go look for one that looks like beta-catenin. 
So some other gene that's knocked down looks just like beta catenin knocked down. Okay, hopefully we're we're following uh, to this point. There's some some sort of biological logic that we're following here. So that's what we're, where we're going to start. And so it goes ahead and does that. It says, okay, we found two uh, data sets where beta catenin is knocked down. Here they are. Let's go run these and let's run a search. So now it's running a search first on uh, the the genes that are downregulated when beta catenin is knocked down. Gets the results. All right, and uh, then it's going to go on and say, what happens, uh, what are the genes, and actually you can see some of the results kind of coming up, we'll come back to these a little bit later, uh, you can say, uh, what about the genes that go up when the, when this gene is knocked down, and we've got this result here, uh, and it runs that search to look for other genes, other profiles that are similar to beta catena knockdown uh, with genes going up, and actually you'll notice already that we see this, this sort of recurring result. Uh, with lots of different members of the, of the IF uh, complex, the IF2 complex. So let's have a look uh, at where that where that got us, because if we come over uh, as these are being run, the actual search is being exported as well as being uh, uh, you know called out here. We can click on this link. This brings us to the actual search that was run, which I have open over here. So if we look at the search results. Uh, and these are the perturbed seek results. Uh, there, are there are many others. If we look at this result and we say, okay, what are the results? Well, first of all, we see beta catena knocked down as the top result. That's expected. And as we come down, one thing that we notice right away is this EIF2. Many different subunits of this complex, when knocked down, uh, result in a very similar profile to beta catena knocked down. And this is extremely robust. You see it. Uh, many of the top results are just different subunits of the same complex, right? And you notice as well, these are the genes that go up with beta catena knockdown. Earlier it ran the genes that go down after beta catena knockdown. The result is extremely similar. Okay, so if we come back to the result here, we can see it did this process not just for beta catenin, but it, it continued and worked its way through the pathway, right? And actually we'll go back to the start, right? It's working through a number of these genes and we're going to come all the way down, right? It's run all of these searches, and now it's going to review. It's going to say, uh, uh, let's come back up here to the conclusions. So now that it's 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 run through the whole pathway, or ma many of the members of, of the pathway, it's looked at data where each pathway member is knocked down. It's looked around to see uh, out in the wide world of, of gene expression data and proteomic data and all kinds of other data types, gen genomics, genetics data. Where have we seen other other genes that when knocked down resemble when pathway knocked down. So uh, these are the results that it finds in the end. Uh, some of these, uh, this we already saw actually. So uh, we saw this with beta catenin. And in fact, there's other proteins in the WIMP pathway that when knocked down also uh, resemble EIF2 knockdown. This is not, this is the top result certainly, but there's other results as well. We won't get, get into all of it. Uh, this, so this is to highlight that we have a hypothesis here, right, about a new target. This is uh, based on a certain data type that we've used here. Uh, this approach can uh, certainly the uh, the input data was a certain data type. We're looking at gene expression, going out finding other examples. Uh, that approach can be generalized, right? So we can try different perturbations. We can try uh, looking at very different data types. We can look at these perturbations of the wind pathway in different contexts. So it could, it could be, you know, in a, in a test tube, in a dish, it could be in, in an animal, it could be in, in clinical data and human data, right? There's a lot of different ways to approach this, and we can look at all of them, right? So there's so there's no reason to to stop with just one approach. We can look uh, across lots of different data types, across lots of different kinds of of biological systems. Right uh, again in in test tubes and animals and humans and in organoids is another another one that we talk about a lot. Uh, so you can use all of that data. We can approach it from different approaches, different kinds of perturbations, whether they're genetic perturbations, pharmacological perturbations. Uh, they can be all different kinds of readouts, right? So RNA, protein, genetics, all of these different things. So at the end of that kind of campaign, that again is using existing data. We can then ask, okay, now that we've 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 searched far and wide, we've used many different approaches. 
what where does it converge? Is there some uh, target hypothesis that has the most experimental support? In this case, uh, in this limited approach, which nevertheless was still marching through the pathway doing a number of searches, uh, EIF2B is is the top uh, the top ranked target, the the strongest hypothesis. Uh, has the most data supporting it that we've uncovered. Uh, so this would be the hypothesis, at least to this point, for, for this new target. Uh, and there's obviously more here that is summarized uh, right, in, in this result, and this can continue. Uh, these sorts of uh, analyses can really be nicely summarized as well. So if we click this button here in our interface, the PowerPoint, uh, it generates a deck. Uh, we can also archive the result itself here so we can reproduce exactly what we have we have here. This uh, PowerPoint generation leads us to uh, this this deck here. Uh, so this was generated again fully autonomously uh, based on the research campaign that you saw that was being executed that was also fully autonomous. So it's going from the question to a summary slide deck uh, in a fully automated way. Uh, telling you here's what we found. So uh, EIF2 complex is the, the top result, but there's actually other interesting results as well. It summarizes what the approach was, what was done, uh, and what the key findings were, as we just have been discussing, and, and what supports them, right? So, so it's not just this target, it's that there's all these subunits that uh, all independently appear. Any one of these knocked down gives you a very similar profile to a went a went pathway knockdown uh, and then other things as well right so we have this nice summary of of everything that was found so what i hope i've shown you is that we we can make headway here we, we can make real progress we can find targets that are actually new that have never been published before that there's no there doesn't have to be any paper on them we, we, there's uh Many of the things that come out of this sort of approach are uh, novel. We certainly do rediscover some of the known things, which is a, a good sign, uh, because also we're rediscovering it from the underlying data. Uh, so this is uh, a way, an approach that can lead to novel findings. Uh, it's also an approach that's transparent, right? So we can see what approach it took, and what, what was its method, what was its approach, what data did it find, where did that data come from exactly, right? So every one of these results, we can trace back to its source. So uh, if there are any hallucinations up from the large language model, we can check and we can actually verify that the data that it's talking about, here's what, where it found it, here's what that data is, here are all the details. So everything here can be verified, right? Um, it's also a concise method, right? Because the winner, the, the uh, hypothesis with the most experimental support is on top. So it's concise, it's transparent, uh, it's robust to noise because we're looking for the, a consensus answer that has the most support. Uh, it's verifiable. It's really, uh, it's rapid, it's scalable, it's all of these things, right? So it's an approach that really can, uh, I think can really move the needle. And I think with this sort of approach, the answer to can a large language model discover a new target? I think it is absolutely. Uh, what I'm showing you here is uh, maybe the first step in a campaign to find a new target to fully validate it, right? We, we've uncovered a certain amount of, of validating data that supports this target. There's always more to do, but clearly the system can uh, identify new things, can provide uh, validation, so, some level of validation, new validation that wasn't known before. Uh, and I think this can actually uh, move the needle and really get us to new targets, new ways to cure diseases, new therapeutics, and improvements in human health. So let me know uh, what you think. Do you agree? What do you think about this? Uh, what has been your experience with large language models or other approaches? I would love to hear. Just add them to the comments below. And uh, thanks for your attention and looking forward to hear, hearing what you think.